Hey everyone, Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust. We've got Chris Mikowski behind the camera. Gary Edelman will be coming on with us in a moment. And we're continuing our trek around Mobile Bay. We're actually at a place called Spanish Fort. It won't surprise you that at one point there was a Spanish fort here uh, because this area today that is Alabama was once uh, ruled by the French, the Spanish, the British, uh, and we'll have the Confederacy here as well as the United States. So there's a lot of history out in this area. And Spanish Fort, uh, for the, those of you who might not know, is on the eastern side of Mobile Bay. The city of Mobile is actually a few miles behind me just across the top of the bay. And we are here um, taking a look at a really cool fort called Fort McDermott, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. But looking out into Mobile Bay, you might be able to see through the trees and out into that area. You might hear the causeway. That causeway will bring cars between Mobile and Daphne, uh, Alabama. So this is a really neat place to go. If you drive across that causeway, that'll take you right into the Bankhead Tunnel. That can take you right down into downtown Mobile. And it's a really neat place to visit. On this side of the river, though, this is where a lot of the battles will take place in March and April of 1865. The city of Mobile doesn't fall until April 12, 1865. There are defenses on the city side of it, but we have Union forces approaching from various points, including Pensacola, Florida, which is about, a, uh, about an hour to the east of us by car. And they are converging at two different places that we'll call Blakely, Fort Blakely, and then here at Spanish Fort. And the two have an interconnected story that uh, Gary Edelman will talk about here in a moment. But behind me is that delta, the, the um, lower end of the delta of Mobile Bay. It's actually going to bring you down the Tensaw River, the Mobile River. You'll have the Tumbigbee River, which will all kind of converge in this area and create a 200,000 acre uh, wetland that is a really neat place to go to, which will eventually kind of pour out like a natural funnel, bringing all these rivers together and create Mobile Bay, which will run for another 32 miles down to the Gulf of Mexico. So when you're looking at this, you're at the top of this uh, Mobile Bay. And we have visited other places like Fort Gaines and Fort Morgan, which are at the mouth of Mobile Bay. So check out those other videos as well. And be sure to share this with your friends, your family. Click that subscribe button and follow us over on Facebook as well as on YouTube. But without further ado, I'm going to bring on Gary Edelman, who's going to set up exactly where we're standing. One of the best uh, preserved fortifications here in Daphne, Baldwin County, Alabama, Fort McDermott. Good. Thanks, Chris, uh, and thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, here we are. This place is cool. It's a, another hidden gem that shouldn't be hidden, okay? This is one of the roughly three redoubts that they had here at Spanish Fort. But other, other, uh, unlike at Fort Blakely that you'll see later, I believe, um, you don't have them supporting one another. Not one can really help the other one. There's no crossfire. This is a difficult position. Blakely is more easily laid out for defense here. So at Blakely, you've got a guy named General Lydell, commanding over there. And here at Spanish Fort, you've got a guy named uh, General Gibson. This is Randall Gibson. You've heard of him throughout the war. He's got a Louisiana brigade. And among this Confederate line, maybe you have 5,000 soldiers or so. 2,000 over here, 3,000 at Blakely, okay? Um, except that as it's going on, where's the danger coming? All of a sudden, a corps shows up at Blakely. That's Steele's guy. And then, guys, and then two corps show up over here under Canby directly, okay? And from late March and into the first several days of April, the Union is starting to get closer. They're constructing parallels. They're establishing battery positions. The Confederates uh, here under Maori go out and actually sally forth to the, toward the Union force to try to slow them down so that maybe they can do something a little bit more to defend here. Spanish Fort has a swamp over on its left flank where they cannot build earthworks. It's impossible to really do over there. So this becomes one of the keys to the whole position here. Um, and I see Chris is showing a map up here where this fort, this redoubt now called Fort McDermott, um, is really going to stand out. Now, while all this is happening, and let me just say that we're lucky to be standing here. Uh, it's great that it's preserved, and it's preserved by the Raphael Sims chapter of the SCV, who preserve um, and maintain a lot of sites um, around Mobile. So kudos on that front. And you can see over here that this is a real deal, like Redoubt, okay, or an enclosed fort. And, um, and it is in a great state of preservation. While all this is playing out, General Dabney Maury, Maury in command of all of the Confederate troops around here, tells some of the forces that are here under... Uh, um, under Gibson to shift some of those troops over toward uh, 
um, General Lydell. And that's like Holt's Clause Brigade. And then the word comes down that he's going to have to send another brigade, Ector. These are little brigades, but we're talking about where a few hundred people really matter when you've only got now 1,700 soldiers here under Gibson. And if you read the official records, one of my favorite parts is the back and forth between Lydell and Gibson and Maori um, back in Mobile. And I'm paraphrasing here. Gibson says to Lydell, I have 1,700 infantry with two corps, you know, with two corps facing me. Um, let me keep Hector's brigade and give me Holt's claw back. Lydell says, man, I'm ordered to take Hector. I don't want to take Hector from you. It's the last thing I want to do. But by the way, the core in front of me is bigger than the two core in front of you uh, combined, you know. And by the way, I'm sending a vote for Hector. I don't want him, but you're going to have to send him to me anyway. Gibson writes to Maori, dude, the larger force is at Spanish Fort. Um, we have the weaker position. We need more soldiers. Let me keep Hector. Answer, period. He's, he's desperate here. And this is while fighting is going on. Uh, he writes to Maori again. Lydell said yesterday he could hold Blakely with the force he had. He doesn't need any more. Um, help me. Lydell, um, you know, load Hector onto the boats and send him to me. Um, you know, Maori says to send them. I mean, by the way, it wasn't even my idea. The last thing I want is to send you anybody else. I'd give you the shirt off my back on my firstborn. But Dabney Maori says to do it. Hey, Gibson says to Maori, what's up, Maori? I'm in the class of 1846, and I'm not going to send you anybody else. Yeah, and that I made up. Uh, the rest is all true. Gibson says to Maori, answer my dispatches. Maori has to make do with it, and that whole time, I'm sorry, Gibson does, he's talking about, I can't hold this place, but we will try, and we will, you know, lend credit to the Confederacy and whatnot. And the... Uh, uh, you know, it's prophetic because the Confederates put up fights. They do sally forth out, but the Union gets closer and closer. Eventually, they compromise the Confederate line on April 8th, and they're going to get around and sort of outflank that area. The Confederates just hoping darkness will come, and they largely retreat, uh, leaving some skirmish men out on the line that they couldn't pull back on a treadway 18 inches wide. Okay, 18 inches wide, they take their shoes off and they literally tiptoe it out of there because they're under Union guns. And if they made any noise, the Union guns could just shell them while they're trying to escape. Some of these guys would make it toward Blakely and all the way to uh, Mobile. Now, of course, this isn't going to go well. Spanish Fort Falls, that allows the Union to put the rest of their force over at Blakely. So there's a significant outcome here um, where the Confederates are really in trouble at this point. Now, I want to note that uh, in his official report near the end, Gibson gets a little bit poetic, and I just want to read a little bit while he's talking about how brave some of the soldiers were during this. He says, the list of these soldiers might be prolonged for with the position we left behind, filling soldiers' graves, many of the bravest and the best, and if any credit shall attach to the defense of Spanish Fort, it belongs to the heroes who sleep, um, whose sleep shall no more be disturbed by the cannon's roar. And not too long after that, he will issue a... Uh, a farewell to the men of his Louisiana brigade. And it's lengthy, and I won't read the whole thing. Um, but he says, your banners are garland with the emblems of every soldierly virtue. M uh, more than 20 battlefields have seen them unfurled. This was his original brigade. He says, having commanded a company and a regiment and this brigade, I've known many of you from the very beginning. I've been with you through all of its various fortunes and offer to each of you the grateful and affectionate farewell. May God bless you. So this is the end for a lot of these Confederate soldiers who have been fighting for four years. To be sure, there are some that weren't there the whole time, but, you know, and, and for those people, Spanish Fort was their civil war. It was just this, and this was not an upper at the end. The Confederates fall back pell-mell. Fort Blakely is going to fall the next day, sorry to spoil the end, and Mobile will fall not long after that. Chris? Yeah, just to add on, you're with the American Battlefield Trust, Chris Mikowski behind the camera. Um, up here in, in Fort McDermott, some people might be saying, why are you on top of the earthworks? Well, that's where the interpretive trail is up here on, at Fort McDermott. So if you do get a chance to, you can see some very impressive gun emplacements. This fort's named for Edward McDermott, uh, who is a Confederate in the Confederate States Navy. Um, but it's a really neat place to come up here and, and to visit. So what I want to do is just uh, cover a couple things. What's happening right now here in Mobile? Okay. August 1864, we've had the falls of uh, Forts Gaines and Morgan. That is going to seal off the mouth of Mobile Bay. We'll also lose Fort Powell, which was another fort down there near the mouth of the bay that would cut off what's called Grant's Pass. So now, essentially, Mobile Bay has been cut off, and the city itself, at least on the seaward side, has been cut off from the rest of the world. On the landward side, uh, you can still go up the, the uh, Mobile River. You can also go up the Tensaw River. The Tensaw is actually right behind us, and it kind of comes down here. You can see it. 
run parallel with the larger body of water, which is just off here to the left of the map, and that's Mobile Bay. So the Tensaw actually pours down into and distributes its waters into Mobile Bay, um, and then eventually it will head down towards the, the Gulf. To the north here, we have Bay Manette, um, and up in this area, this is a large body of water that is going to isolate the Confederates here at Spanish Fort from those who are off the top of our map at Fort Blakely. So even if the Confederates wanted to run a long defensive line between the two positions to try to block the Federals that are coming in from here, they have this large natural body of water that's there. If you drive across it, it to this day is huge. So there's no way to link the two positions here. Add to that problem that the US Navy is steaming up into Mobile Bay and we have very few Confederate ships at this point of the war and really any point of the war. So down in this area, we can see the Confederates have set up a long line of fortifications, redoubts, which are many forts. Um, here we're standing at Fort McDermott on the right flank. Old Spanish Fort sat near the banks of the Tensaw River. Um, and there would be roads running through this area that would go from Pensacola to Mobile and then run on towards New Orleans. The old Federal Road would run in this area as well. Um, then we have the Union lines you can see here that literally parallel the Confederate lines. And that is how you establish siege operations. And you might notice the number of Union batteries. Those are cannons, artillery positions along there. So this is going to be a, a basically no-win situation. If you're a Star Trek fan, this is the Kobayashi Maru. <laughs> then on top of it, we have uh, these fortifications. Now, who's going to build these fortifications? Uh, to start there, we have Confederates who will be in the area, but we also will have uh, slave labor that is used. Many of the plantation owners in the area will not just give up their slaves freely. They will actually have to be leased out to the Confederacy who will build these. We'll also have the United States Colored Troops build these fortifications, not as Union soldiers, but as prisoners of war. Some of these are the same men who are captured at Fort Pillow in 1864 who will be out here helping to build these fortifications. Of course, you'll have uh, Confederates themselves building them as well. So these fortifications are extensive and it takes a lot of manpower to build these uh, fortifications. Also, Chris Bukowski wanted me to mention some of the men who might be uh, manning these fortifications here, as well as Blakely. And some of those are the former men of the Army of, of uh, Tennessee. Those are the Confederates who would have been just ravaged at places like Franklin and Nashville, and then sent down to places like Mobile to either lick their wounds or help to protect the uh, very soft underbelly of the Confederacy. And that's what we start to see in this area. Uh, but I also want to mention some of the, the 20th century history up here. That causeway that would bring you across here, that causeway um, was very vital to bringing the uh, traffic, um, vehicular traffic across from Mobile over here to Spanish Fort. When it's completed in the 1920s, there are problems with it. Uh, it will flood all the way up into the 60s and 70s whenever Mobile Bay would rise and fall. And once you got to this side, the east side of Mobile Bay, you run into the problem that the cars were underpowered and the banks were very steep. So in fact, once you get your way, you made your way across the old causeway, you might have to hire a mule team on this <laughs> side of Spanish Fort to actually pull your car up and over. Before this, how did you uh, circumvent having to go all the way around this bay? You would hire a ferry that would take you back and forth between Spanish Fort as well as Mobile. So once the Bankhead Tunnel will eventually open up, it was a fee tunnel until about 1974, um, that'll help bring you into Mobile. You'll have the causeway. Now you have the more modern bridges in downtown. So this for a transportation end of things as well. For modern Mobilians, Daphne, as well as over here in Spanish Fort, the infrastructure over here was very important. So unfortunately, with the growth of that infrastructure, that's how we start to lose this battlefield here at Spanish Fort. And in the 1950s, we start to see housing plans uh, spring up in the area. In fact, we have houses to my right. You can probably see one right behind me off to my left, just on the other side of this fortification, and then the city street down below us, which will lead you down to more houses. So this area um, had some, you know, this, this is the, the problem that you have when history meets, you know, expansion, and this is at least one portion of the puzzle that we have here. Now, if you wanna see a more intact battlefield, we do encourage you to come out here to Fort McDermott, obviously, 
head up to see our friends at Fort Blakely who we'll see also in this trip. And at Fort Blakely, uh, which is Blakely uh, State Park, just to the north of us, we'll have land preserved by the members of the American Battlefield Trust, as well as our other partners who are helping to put together that battlefield. And it's a recreation park, it's a camping site, and it's a historic park all rolled into one and a really, really neat place to go. Let me just wrap this up by saying, you know, this is the type of thing that Chris White can do, like hop on the camera for a few thoughts and then wax you know, about so many different things. So when we ask you all, we're not asking, we didn't ask for money on this trip, um, but when we ask you to support our trips, this is the kind of interpretation that you've come to expect and that you can enjoy with, you know, historians on staff and off staff, uh, you know, just riffing about history. So if you enjoy it, please keep your eye out. Sometimes we do need support on these trips and we appreciate you watching and all the support you offer. If you support this PBS, Special, you will get this free Gary Edelman hat for only $1 million. And it won't be washed, so that's your warning there. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris Mikowski behind the camera. Thank you for watching, and thanks to uh, everybody doing everything to support so much here in Mobile and for your support of Battlefield Preservation and Education.